everybody. Good morning. It is five after, so we need to get started. We've got to have an extended set up this morning to we find ourselves in unique circumstances today. Well, not necessarily unique. We've done this before. Um, we have a week upstairs, and so we're going to have a meeting down here today so we can get that resolved. But it's very good to see everyone today. It's a beautiful sunny day outside. It's a lot of blessed to quit. Will you please bow your head and open us up? Our most gracious, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for loving us, for blessing us, for giving us a place to worship you, God, to come together and to fellowship together, God. We thank you, God, for all the blessings that you give to us. And we thank you for the love that you show us each and every day, God. Please, God, help us to glorify you and to praise you and to love you in a way that only you deserve, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm. All right, we do have our bulletins, so look into your bulletins there for our today's announcement. You are invited to Sunday School each and every Sunday at 10 a.m. I encourage you to invite others to Sunday School as well. We have really good Sunday school classes. Um, we have really good fellowship in those classes. And if you have the opportunity, please invite someone, anybody that you meet or anybody that you know that might be one of place to come to. And uh, you're invited to invite them to Sunday school as well. And then at 11 a.m. we have our morning services. Today we do have a lunch at 12.30. We are honoring our service members around the world, but that especially that are part of our church here as well. So we'll be honoring the service members. Wednesday at 6.30 we have the Greek share class. 7 p.m. we have the Cross Bible Study and the Men's Bible Study. So we're invited to those as well. Just as a reminder, our building fund giving for October was $300, just below $300, and I'll have to say only $300, because we've done, we've given more in the past. Um, the building fund box is right over here. If you go ahead and give to the box today, which is the building fund today, it is right up there. As I already stated, we do have Veterans Day lunch after service, and everyone is welcome. Thanksgiving food boxes is important. When ladies group plans to give to four families, and in the past, what we've done is we've had boxes set aside and we put we put different food items into those boxes. This time around, we're asking that you donate um, money, you donate funds. Is that correct, Maria? We want money donated this time, and then the boxes will be purchased, the food will be purchased, and that will be given to those four families. The food will be purchased by November 23rd, so boxes will be given out on November 24th. Give your donations to Debbie or to Kim. So you've got that in the bulletin as well. <clears throat> November 11th through 12th, the annual meeting at Moore First Baptist. The agenda is in the Baptist Messenger. There's a Thunder Game for those who want to participate, November 15th, first of the sun, so it's $13 CJ, if that's something you want to participate in. And there are still tickets available. Sold out this morning. Oh, sold out this morning, sorry. We don't have enough data for it, but try to catch it next time. Looking ahead, the fall games are November 17th. So this is the fall games, our ongoing loving fellowship competition with Salatista. That is the volleyball. That's all. Yes. It's been changed to mush ball. Oh, it's going to be. Mm -hmm. It changed up to mush ball this time. We had an edge in volleyball. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. They're scared. Yeah, they're scared. <laughs> <laughs> scared them all. Um, so it is going to be still November 17th, but it'll be most fun. So, uh, let's see, looking ahead, Paul Haynes, uh, November 23rd, church cleanup. Very important. If you can get out here, please, and, uh, you can always clean up every day, like today when you do church cleanup. If you, if you feel like you can spend some time here and do some cleaning, things like that, there's always cleaning we can do because that's the designated day this time around. Church cleanup, November 23rd. November 28th is the Thanksgiving Community Dinner. In the month of November is wear your native attire. If you look around the room, Jamie, what happened? You didn't. <laughs> you see a, 
<laughs> that sounds like me. We, we have a lot of nice ribbon skirts out there. You guys take a look at those. And all the ladies have these beautiful skirts on today. Um, I don't see any men with any. I missed Chris last week. Chris had something on it. We missed his last week. Look at all the nice, beautiful attire that we have on today as well. At this time, I'm going to ask that Debbie come up and do our prayer.
be blessed and assured.
played on the National Mall there, the National Museum of the American Indian. And, but to even know that seeds definitely were planted, that you know there are people there, you know, we interacted with the family that um, they're not Christians, but the film really moved them and they just had a lot of questions and everything and just really enjoyed it and you know people even more people wanting that film in their language and they're not even believers and that's you know to me that's just a great thing but it was just um we had a lot of fun but just a great experience being there and you know especially at the capital of our nation to see that and the gospel proclaim proclaim there Else. We heard some really beautiful music today. That first song that Megan sang and that we had was Who Do You Say That I Am? Yeah, and that's, that's taken from Matthew, and Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's saying, Who do you say that I am? And he's not asking the question like, Oh, you're, you're Jesus. He's asking the question, Who, who am I? And he's looking for that response. You are God. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. But that, that Jesus is Lord of their lives is the question he was asking. And that's a question we have to ask ourselves every day. Is Jesus the Lord of our life? And are we living that way? Something to be thinking about. Does anybody else have any other thing they want to say? Testimony? All right, at this time, we will worship the Lord through giving. I'm going to ask that uh, Preston and Carson, would you like to please come up and we'll serve everyone in the baptism. Of course, we know that Preston just got baptized last week. So we're going to give him a big hand. Preston, why don't you please ask God to bless our offering today?
ask your blessing on our service today and our service families that are present here today as well. And their families, God. We thank you, God, for the love that you show to us, God. We thank you, God, for the holiness that that only you have, God, that, that only you can display. Lord, we thank you, God, for sanctifying each one of us so that we can come closer to you, God, and know you more, Lord. Please, God, thank you us, Pastor Randy, as you bring your message to us today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You all may be saved. Joshua chapter 5. Some have gone on. 
gone into the promised land. Okay. And one day all of us will. All of us will enjoy the fruits of what we have put our faith in. And again, right here is something that's almost brand new. It's, it's something that they're on the very... I mean, they're, they're just right... Most commentators agree that when you read the scriptures, especially in the book of Joshua, that if you can see a map, the Israelites, the Hebrew children, have crossed over the Jordan River, and they are actually on the west side of the Jordan River. They had to cross the Jordan just like they crossed the Red Sea. When Moses took them across where, where, where God used Moses and they divide, he divided the waters and the Israelite people went through the waters. The same thing happened here with the Jordan as well. The Jordan dried up and the Israelite people went across. And because of that, <clears throat> in the very first few verses of chapter 5, it says the Amorite kings, the Canaanite, Canaanite kings, and all those that were there in that area that lived there, they saw what God did. And they became afraid. They saw the power of God that they had crossed over. And it says actually they're, they're, they lost heart and their courage failed because of the Israelites. And as they camped, <clears throat> They did some things in preparation for them entering into the promised land. One of the things that you'll read approximately like in verse, verse 2 up to verse 9, there was something that they had that they were required to do, and that was circumcision. It was a physical circumcision. I'm going to speak that just a little It's hitting my hairspray hair. Because uh, uh, <clears throat> that something's crawling. <laughs> but before they could enter, they had to be circumcised. Now, does everybody know what circumcision is? Raise your hand if you do. If you, do. If you understand what it is. Okay. <clears throat> Fleshly speaking, it's the cutting of the foreskin. And you know what that means. It's cutting away that flesh. But that was a sign of a covenant between them and God. In one instance, the wife of Moses, before Moses was actually in on, in on the whole deal, even though he kind of like, I really don't want to do this, I really don't want to be the deliverer, his wife told him. In fact, Moses died. How many of you knew that? Moses actually died. And it took his wife, because his wife was an unbeliever. His wife had to go in and circumcise the boys and throw those foreskins upon Moses. And Moses, when that happened, he was revived. And you don't see that in the uh, Ten Commandments movie. When you read the, the narrative, Moses was unresponsive. The Lord was going to take his life. Because of his wife. He was revived. And it was a sign of a covenant. Now, do we are we required to do that today? No. If you've never been circumcised physically, don't think that's a that, that's you're not going to get into heaven. Okay, don't, don't think that. That's not that's not true. But what we undergo in today's, in our understanding of the scriptural principles, we go through a circumcision as well, but it's a spiritual circumcision. The New Testament calls it a, super, a circumcision of the heart where the flesh is cut away. And that communion with God is enabled. No more 
personal agenda, no more, well, I think I ought to do this, I think I ought to do that, uh, I think this is best for me. There's no flesh involved. It's spiritual. But there must be a cutting of our hearts, a circumcision of the heart. And so you see that taking place there prior to their entry, prior to their occupation of the promised land. It was a preparation for them. Much like we are in preparation for that day. That day we will enter the promised land. We call it sanctification, like I said earlier. <clears throat> We're learning in our daily walk to be more like Jesus. To pray more earnestly. To serve more faithfully. To live more righteously. That's what God calls us to do. That's our duty. Soldiers. A soldier in list. Basically, he's no longer an individual. He becomes a part of a unit. They shave their heads. You know, I like to I like to watch some of these old these, these military movies. And the first thing you see them do is sit in a chair, man. They're eating that haircut. Then just get this gone. You know. And everybody looks like everybody else. They all wear the same fatigues. They all wear the same clothing as they go through boot camp. And they go through training. They learn how to fire a weapon. They learn how to survive. They learn how to take care of one another. They learn how to, what do you do if you get wounded? They learn all these things in order to be a good soldier to survive. John Wayne, in one of those movies, John Wayne said, some of you aren't coming back. As he told his recruits, some of you aren't coming back. And what we see here again is a preparation for the conquest of the promised land. And it says, as they were camped out at this place called Gilgal, kind of interesting play on the words because Gilgal the noun the noun part of that word means a circle but the verb part of it when you see it used in this particular passage the verb part of the word Gilgal means to roll to move to advance and so here they were camped out and something happened here the manna, remember the manna that fell for their provisions, for them to eat? <clears throat> that had been going on all this time. We see an instance of it early in the, in, in the uh, first five books of Moses. We, we see that in their history, in, in the book of Exodus and Davis. But it had been going on all this time to provide for their nutrition. But something happened here. In verse 12, it says, after they had began to eat the produce of the land, their, home, their new homeland, it says the manna ceased. And since there was no more manna for the Israelites that ate from the crops of the land of Canaan that year. In other words, the provision of God got them to where they were supposed to be. He got them to the blessedness of that promised land. And it ceased from all. And all of a sudden, the, ne the next thing, <clears throat> in verse 13, it says, when Joshua was near Jericho, they were near Jericho because Jericho was like the staging area for the conquest. Jericho kind of sat in the plain. But once you got past Jericho, if you could, if you could take Jericho militarily, if you could take Jericho, it would open up the door to the promised land, to what we know as Israel today. Jericho was a fortified city, and it served as a barrier to the mountains because the mountains were right there behind it. But once you took Jericho, basically the war was over because that would open up the gates conquest. They could enter and conquer. 
But he says, when Joshua was, was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. I was kind of looking around. <clears throat> I was upstairs and went back here. I, was looking, I thought there was a big sword somewhere. Maybe I was mistaken. I don't know, maybe it was over there. But can you imagine? As Joshua was preparing, because again, he had received instructions because Moses had now died. He was awaiting instructions, camped out there with millions of his people, thousands of soldiers ready for the orders to conquer. And so here he was. He sees a man standing there in front of him. And in my mind, I think that he's probably something that looks very mighty, a big man. Muscled up. Kind of like me. So, I say that because I, at one time, I couldn't fit in that chair. That's a sign of, that I'm comfortable in now. If I have stood up, it would have still stuck to me. <laughs> but there was this mighty man standing there in front of him with a sword that was drawn out of nowhere. A magnificent man, a man, a figure of a man who stood there again with a sword. And Joshua goes and asks him, Are you for us or for, are you against us? And what does this one say? He says, Neither. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. I love that phrase in the Bible. The commander of the Lord's army. <clears throat> Again, theologians all agree that who he is looking at is God himself. And as commander of the Lord's army, he stands there because again, Joshua has in mind <clears throat> the conquest of Jericho. If he can take Jericho, he can take the land. And they're prepared to fight. They're prepared for war. And as he stands there, again in my in my heart, in my mind, I think, I think, I think, I think Joshua is out there meditating with the Lord. I think he's seeking the heart of God. Because he knows the road ahead is going to be difficult. And there's this man, God himself, standing there with a the sword drawn. And he says, who are you? Are you with us or against us? Then again, he says, I am neither. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. And then Joshua bowed his face to the ground in worship and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. The context of this historical event, again, is right, it is right before the conquest of Jericho. If you read the next chapter, it'll tell you the story of when they began to march around the city. The city was huge. They didn't have to go in there and burn it down. They didn't have to do anything to it. They didn't have to blow it up. They didn't have, all they had to do was march. And those marching orders came from God. It was God's instruction to do exactly what he told them to do. They didn't even have to bring out the bows and the arrows. They didn't have to bring out the swords and the spears. All they had to do was listen to God. And they marched on that last day, seven times around that great city. Joshua told them, he said, don't shout until I tell you to. And when they came to that last lap around the city, he said, shout 
And all the people began to shout. And what happened? Did they go in there? Not at first. But what did have to happen? You keep vegetating. If you've ever watched VeggieTales, you should know the answer. <laughs> the walls fell down, didn't they? Again, they didn't have bulldozers, they didn't have tanks, they didn't have giant equipment. They just simply listened to God, and God told them what to do. <clears throat> as you read the story, and as you read the stories from here on out about the life of Joshua and all his conquests and all that he did, one thing stands true in all the whole narrative of his life, and it's this, that God fought the battles for him. What kind of battles are you facing today? What's your battle? A lot of different ones, aren't there? A lot of different battles going on in our world, within our lives sometimes. Sometimes we battle personalities. You have somebody in your family you just kind of put up with and hope they don't stay too long. Ah, don't shake their head. I saw somebody shake their head. <clears throat> oh man, I'm sorry. Out there taking all the leftovers. <laughs> That was for my dinner tomorrow. <laughs> I know that because that's, I've experienced it in my family. <laughs> Where'd they get that car? They must have rented it. <clears throat> but sometimes the battles sometimes are familial, relationship. Don't might, might, not, might not get along quite well with others in your family. But what about your job? What about your occupation? What do you do? Is your battle at your job? Are you worried about work? Are you worried about, man, I don't think they're going to rehire me. Right? I don't think I'm going to make it through the next physical year. It's funny, but it was funny because when I when I when I became the manager of our department about five years ago now, everybody was worried. But one, they didn't know me. And a lot of the people in that office was worried because they thought I was gonna come in there and fire them. I wanted to, but I didn't want to. Because I knew through their experience and their, they, they knew what to do and how to do things, I kept them on. But as I went along, I found out, oh man, I should have fired. No. <laughs> but I made it a matter of prayer. I began to pray. I didn't pray, Lord, get rid of this one, get rid of that one. I just began to pray. And there were four people that Again, I, I wish I could have just fired that wheel. I, I could have, but there were four people that were just, I, I, I'd get complaints from the chief's office, I'd get complaints from the national council about these four people all the time. They're this way with our citizens. They, they, they ignore our citizens, blah, 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 blah. And so I began to pray. Made it a matter of prayer. And in one week in February, the first, I think the first or second week in February, one of them died. And the other three resigned. And I was thinking, Lord, I didn't mean it to be that bad, you know, <clears throat> mean for them to die. But he had some health issues. And those four people. They were out of our program. But folks, sometimes our battles might be with our career. Sometimes your battles may be things that you might not be able to even to see. Sometimes those battles are your fears, private fears. Maybe you're afraid of not being able to make it to the end of the month. 
Maybe you're fearful about your health condition. That's a very real thing. So I was fearful. You know, I was I was laying there and I was still under anesthesia at some point. And the person was with me. And the doctor, I heard the doctor. He said, I think we found something. I, 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 was, I was still coming out of that anesthesia, but I heard that clearly. And I thought, I've got cancer. But even in my grogginess, trying, they were trying to wake me up, you know, and to, you know, get me going. I prayed. I said, God, whatever path I have to walk, I know you'll walk with me. I didn't know the seriousness of, the, of it. I didn't know how bad it was. And I know others <clears throat> have gone through the same thing, have experienced that same dreaded disease. And sometimes I feel, for one, I feel, I feel very fortunate because they caught it very early, <clears throat> very early stage. It had, in fact, it hadn't even turned into cancer yet. It was about to. But I think about all those who have gone through this <clears throat> and experienced this, this and, and the pain, the pain from that, and even the loss that we experience. Sometimes it's a it's a battle. It's a scary battle to look forward. And that's what Joshua was looking at. He knew. At where he was on the cusp of the battle to take Jericho. That there will be some pain. He knew people would die. He knew that people would rebel. And as he began to prepare, again, I think he was off by himself. I believe he was praying to the Lord. And God appeared to him as the commander of the Lord's army. Who fights your battles? I've known many Christians for a long time. <clears throat> they grow weary, they grow tired. Their mind begins to think otherwise when they try to fight the battles on their own. Well, I've done it this long. I've, I've done this, or I've, I've been a part of this. And, 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 they, and they seem to want to take the battle on for themselves. Look, let me, let me tell you just short. Whatever you're facing, whatever battles you're encountering, give it to the Lord. Tell the Lord this is His battle. God, this is yours. I want to give it to you. I can't fight it. It's destroying me. It's taking my, it's taking my wherewithal to live life and it's taking it and throwing it in the dump. I don't even feel like living anymore. Give that battle to God. And the battles can be a lot of different things. But he says, I have come now as commander of the Lord's army. And Joshua bowed his face to the ground in worship. The last thing he tells him, I don't think to allow God to be your commander, to let God be your commander in chief, to let God fight your battles. Look at what the last verse says. For the last few, he says, when he bowed his face to the ground, he says, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? He says, the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. It 
As Joshua sought the instruction from the Lord. Perhaps he thought, well, I sure could use about a thousand more bow arrows. Probably use some more rock, rock propelling, whatever, whatever they are. Because he said, we, we, have to, we have to take that city and there's a giant wall there. We need something to, to get over that wall or get through it. We need something. And all he says is, what does the Lord want to say in history? A lot of times we spend all of our lives saying, God, why don't you do this? God, take care of this for me. Because a lot of times we go, we go through life and we don't like to experience the badness of things, of life, do we? We don't want to think that we, we can get sick. We don't want to think that we can be poor. We don't like to think that we can, we can have an have a, a unhappy life. We think everything should be like a bowl full of cherries all the time as Christians. But it just ain't so. We go through hard times too. I grew up I grew up knowing poverty. I know what commodities are. You know, today, man, they they over at Creek Nation, we have some nice food distribution centers. It's like a regular grocery store. You can get a cart, get what you need. Back then, they had it on the back of the truck and they just gave you boxes of stuff and that's all you could get. No bread. Farina. You know what farina is? And we had to eat that. Man, my grandma and my aunts, my mom, they were, they were chefs because they could take that and make a great meal out of it. My cousin used to call, we used to get cans that had meat in it. And we believed him because he called that horse meat that one time. He said, well, I'm going to give us horse meat again. And that's what we used to think, it was horse meat. And we was okay with it. It didn't bother us, we ate it. And they would make stew out of it. Do different things. But I've known the side of poverty in my life. Even to the point of where we couldn't just go to Walmart and buy clothes. Sometimes we had to wait. We, we, we'd be at church and somebody would bring us a bunch of bags of clothes. And we'd go through those and find stuff that fit. And I was embarrassed one time because I found me a shirt. And it had the number 11 on it. In red. There's a nice shirt, a football shirt. I got it. My mom washed that in the sink because we didn't have a washer and dryer. She hung it over our wood stove in the, in the living room because we didn't have a big dryer. And I was so proud because I liked that shirt. And I walked to school one day. And I was embarrassed because there was a guy at church, or basketball, there was a guy at school. He said, that's my shirt. He said, we gave it away to give to some poor people. I didn't know if I should cry. I felt, I felt so low. Because I had to wear something that belonged to somebody else. I couldn't afford something new. I couldn't afford something at Walmart. I couldn't afford to go anywhere and shop for my clothes at Worthams or, or any other store in the fall. I had to wear something that belonged to somebody. Somebody was going to throw it away. And I was embarrassed. But I've known life in poverty. But you know, in every turn, in every instance, I was the oldest of our children, or my mom and my dad's family. I was the oldest child. And I could see their struggle. 
I could see that dad worked, but I always knew that there were times that we couldn't always afford good meals. And I remember one time, and God did this a lot. Sometimes we would come home and there'd be food on our porch, not knowing where it came from. We went to the store one time in Oklahoma City. It was my daddy's birthday. My mom had just a few dollars. I was going to go and get something for to make him try to make him a cake. And as we were walking into the store, I saw a twenty dollar bill laying on the ground. And I said, "Mom, it's money." Of course, my mom went over and <laughs> stood on it. So somebody quit looking. But even in those things, God provided. I can't remember a time when I was ever hungry as a kid. It was beans or potatoes. Next day it was potatoes or beans. The third day it was either beans or potatoes, whatever was left over. But God had a way of providing. And sometimes I battled that. I battled that even my adult life. What I had to go through, what I had to live like when I was growing up as a kid. And sometimes that has translated over to me and to my kids. No, you don't need that. It's too expensive. My oldest daughter, Katie, she's like 20, 27, 28? One of those. She wanted some jeans one time from Dillers. She said, Dad, can we get those jeans? They're, they're on sale. And I know, well, you know, I know dealers. It's not, not Walmart. <clears throat> First up, we have JoJo of Siwa. Man, you want somebody to kiss him. <laughs> but my daughter said, Dad, I want some jeans. They're on sale. And I said, Well, how much are they on sale? She said like 80 something dollars. Or she said they're 25%. She said, but they're 80 dollars. I said, and I just said no. I said, that's too much for jeans. Of course, everybody else wore them. I knew that kind of made her upset. But then a couple days later, we went to the dollar store on Kima. She was younger, yeah, she was young, went to high school. And they just happened to have a Gloria Vanderbilt jeans. They were five dollars a piece. I told her, I said, "Go get you five pairs of those jeans. Gloria Vanderbilt jeans are five dollars." She just walked out of the store, went back to the car. They didn't say a word. I was kind of teasing her, you know. But that's kind of the things that the way I grew up. I, I, I try to I try to be frugal in our life as family. You know, if I know the girls will do this, I'll eat my bologna sandwich for lunch. I'll take my lunch. So we're trying to save money for here and there. But that's just the kind of way I was brought up. But the battles are there. We need to understand that God is the one who fights our battles. But the last thing he did up there, he says, he tells him, what do, you, what, do, what do you want to say to me? He tells him, take off the shoes, take off the sandals from off your feet, because where you're standing is holy ground. Most of the time in the scriptures where when God tells somebody to remove their sandals or remove the shoes from their feet, it was a sign of respect. A res it, it, it was also a sign of all high all holiness what does that say for us today in our battles but what he says to us 
Let me fight your battles. But I want to spend more time with you. That's what I think he's saying here. Remove the sandals from your feet. He wants us to begin to experience more of himself, more of God in our life than we do presently. That's where the battles are won. And if you read the life of Joshua, you'll see where, where he spends time with God. The battle is already won. Following this victory at Jericho, there are other victories that come. And they are victorious. Even though they may be outnumbered, they are victorious because it says the Lord fought the battle for them. They just had to do what God told them to do. They just had to be obedient. But whenever they decided to do something or take something that wasn't there, the spoils of war, whenever they, whenever they just kind of, oh man, we conquered this place, I'm going to take that gold. They would rebel. It would cost them. God wants us to understand through the life of Joshua and his passage here that we face many battles. But we need to let God know that that battle is going to be His from now on. So whatever you're facing, give it to the Lord. And the last thing that we saw here about the shoes. God wants you to be more in the presence of God than you were before. Even of this day, God wants more of you in His presence. He wants more of you overall. To talk to you. To love you, to provide for you, to watch over you, to care for you, to take just, just whatever he wants to do in your life. He wants more of you in his presence. Let me ask you about your business for a moment. <laughs> What's your battle today? What's your battle? What are you facing? Is it fearful? Unsettled? Just not sure what's going to happen? Give that battle to the Lord. Just tell him, God, I, I, I can't do anything about the outcome. I can't do anything to solve it. I can't do anything to make myself feel better. Take this battle. It's yours. I don't know the answers. Take this battle from me. But he also wants us to be in his presence. To experience more of him in your life. Lord, I... I want to know you even more. I want to know you even more than I know you today. Draw me close to your side. Draw me to you so that I may know you. How much you love me. How you take care of me. How you provide for me. Draw me to your side. Thank you. I think we all need a part of this. And I want to just ask you a question. You don't have to <clears throat> say yes or no. Do you desire, do you desire a closer walk with Jesus? Just simply raise your hand. I'm not looking around. Do you desire a closer walk with Jesus? Raise your hand right now. Thank you. Many you raise your hand. Desire. Desire that. That's what he wants in your life. He wants you to be close to him closer than you are even today. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you do. For the many things that we face in our daily lives. We don't know the answers to. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know if we'll have enough money. We don't know if we'll have this or that. We don't know if we're going to be okay. Or we want to turn that battle over to you. We want you to be our commander. And fight it for us. 
And Lord, we give ourselves to you. To draw near to you. To draw nigh <coughs> to you. To see your face. To be close to you. In all of our ways. Thank you, Lord, for having us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm not going to have a song this morning. I appreciate your attention. We're going to have lunch here in just a few minutes, but before we do, um, last Sunday, in the stormy weather, we had a, we had our baptism. First time we've had baptism as as me being a pastor in the church. Of course, we had to go to the church, but uh, I've done a baptism before, but it was at Fall Street, and uh, it was a joy to go over there and see those who came and be with us during that time. And uh, we were able to baptize three. There's a few others; they have a few questions. We should be praying for them. <clears throat> but uh, I told them that this morning. We give out their certificates and the Bibles, but the other other two they couldn't make it today. But Preston's here, so Preston, I want to call you on up. Preston, this is Preston Easton. Uh, it was a joy to actually to lead him to the Lord. He can profess Christ as his Lord and Savior. You know, want him to come. And this is his certificate of baptism. It says this certifies that Preston Eastman baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit on the third day of November 9, 2024 at Indian Nations Baptist Church. Church Secretary Darlene and Pastor Gary This is your Thank you. <laughs> so I for the church as your name, church, and my name. And uh, I expect this to be well fucked out. We'll see Brent. Look at it. Thank you. 